there's a very interesting relationship between height, growth hormone, and longevity that I wanted to talk about. Let's start with one of the biggest humans in history. Andre the Giant was 7 foot 4 inches or 224 centimeters tall, who weighed 520 pounds or 236 kilos. He was a giant quite literally because of suffering from a genetic condition called gigantism that made him produce excessive amounts of growth hormone. This made him grow and he had enormous hands and feet, which is called acromegaly. Growth hormone plays an important role in growth and development during puberty and childhood. Growth hormone stimulates the production of IGF-1 that then mediates bone growth, muscle mass, and makes you grow. How much growth hormone and IGF-1 you're exposed to during development determines your overall height. How you respond to this surge is influenced by genetics and childhood nutrition. However, how much growth hormone and IGF-1 you're exposed to during developmental years has also been seen to determine the organism's lifespan, and producing less growth hormone results in longer life in mice. In humans, acromegaly is associated with a higher risk of cancer, heart disease, and overall mortality. People with acromegaly have a twofold higher mortality risk compared to the general population. Andre didn't live for very long. He died at the age of 46 to congestive heart failure due to his enlarged heart from acromegaly called cardiomegaly. There's also the opposite condition of insufficient growth hormone and IGF-1 production during developmental years, which is called Larone syndrome. People with Larone syndrome live average lifespans, 70 to 80 years, but they have a much lower risk of cancer and diabetes than the general population because of low IGF-1 levels. So you have this very interesting situation where people with excessive growth hormone production live shorter and they get more chronic diseases, especially cancer and heart failure. Whereas people with less growth hormone production or insufficient growth hormone production live longer and they have less chronic diseases, especially cancer. When it comes to animals, then larger animals like whales and humans typically live longer than shorter animals like mice and dogs. However, smaller individuals within species live longer than larger individuals of that species. For example, smaller dogs live twice as long as large dogs. While a Great Dane's life expectancy is 6 to 8 years, a Chihuahua's is 10 to 18 years. Larger dogs are also more prone to most of the chronic diseases, especially cancer and osteoporosis. But what about humans? Is there any evidence that being shorter and smaller in body weight is beneficial for longevity in humans? In the past, height was a good indicator of socioeconomic status and better living conditions, resulting in longer life. This Spanish study saw that in the years 1835 to 1869, men over 170 centimeters or 5 foot 7 inches lived 7.6 years longer than men shorter than 160 centimeters or 5 foot 3 inches because height was determined by socioeconomic status and living conditions. The difference in life expectancy disappeared in those born between 1900 to 1939 mostly because living standards and medical care improved for everyone. This 2002 study on baseball players saw that shorter individuals lived longer, even though everyone's life expectancy had increased since the beginning of the 20th century. As you can see, the shortest baseball players, 162 centimeters or 64 inches, lived longer than those who were 193 centimeters or 76 inches in the early 20th century as well as in the end of the 20th century. Keep in mind that these are all baseball players and they should have the same access to medical care and finances. There's also a study on US veterans that saw that men who were less than 175.3 centimeters, less than 5 foot 8, lived 4.95 years longer than taller men. Men shorter than 170.2 centimeters, less than 5 foot 6, lived 7.46 years longer than men over the height of 182.9 centimeters, over 6 feet tall. Men who weighed less than 63.6 kilograms, less than 140 pounds, also lived 7.72 years longer than men who weighed over 90.9 kilograms, over 200 pounds. So yes, there does appear to be an association between height and longevity in humans, with people who are shorter than 175 centimeters living longer than people who are taller than that. The reason for that is thought to be because of the association between IGF-1 levels and growth hormone during developmental years. If you produce less IGF-1 and growth hormone during development, you will be shorter. Now, there are medical ways to counteract that. Children can get growth hormone to grow taller if they show signs that they're not producing enough growth hormone. Lionel Messi is one example of that. But based on the evidence, people who are shorter live longer than the taller individuals. This phenomenon is called antagonistic pleiotropy. What enhances fitness early in life may have harmful effects on lifespan later in life and vice versa. Growth hormone and IGF-1 support growth and proper development early in life. 
but later in life, they increase the risk of cancer and mortality. The reason antagonistic pleiotropy exists is because evolution doesn't care how long you live. It doesn't care about your maximum lifespan. Evolution only cares about short-term reproductive success so you can carry on your genes to the next generation. That's why what favors short-term survival in the reproductive years and developmental years might not necessarily be optimal for maximum lifespan. There is evidence for antagonistic pleiotropy in humans as well. This study on 276,000 UK individuals saw that individuals with higher polygenetic scores for reproduction have lower survivorships to age 76. Basically, people with higher genetic reproductive traits are less likely to survive until the age of 76. Those with a low score are the most likely to live past 76, at least in this cohort of people. Now, the practical takeaway of this is limited because you can't control your genetics and you can't control your height past your reproductive years. But there might be a lesson you can take away regarding IGF-1 and your risk of mortality. IGF-1 has an element of antagonistic pleiotropy because it supports growth during puberty and development, but it can increase the risk of cancer later in life. IGF-1 peaks in puberty and declines with age, but high IGF-1 later in life is associated with cancer, heart disease, and a higher risk of mortality. What it means is that very high IGF-1 levels throughout your life might shorten your lifespan and increase the risk of cancer. Indeed, high IGF-1 levels in the general population haven't seemed to be associated with a higher risk of cancer, heart disease, and all-cause mortality. However, the relationship is U-shaped with both low and high levels being associated with increased risk. The lowest risk for cancer, cardiovascular disease, and all-cause mortality is seen at 120 to 160 nanograms per milliliter, based on a 2023 meta-analysis. The reason high IGF-1 levels are associated with increased mortality is mostly because of increased risk of cancer. Remember Larone syndrome. These people have genetically very low IGF-1, and they virtually have no cancer or diabetes. The reason why low IGF-1 below 100 nanograms per milliliter is seen to be associated with increased mortality is because of frailty, sarcopenia, and bone fractures, because IGF-1 is needed for bone growth. Low IGF-1 is also often the result of malnutrition or low protein intake, which results in low bone density and low muscle mass. This again increases the risk of frailty and fractures. Another problem is that low IGF-1 might also increase the risk of neurodegeneration, as IGF-1 is needed for neuronal growth. In humans, low IGF-1 levels at below 110 nanograms per milliliter haven't seen to be associated with an increased risk of Alzheimer's disease, compared to IGF-1 between 120 to 170 nanograms per milliliter. However, low IGF-1 below 100 nanograms per milliliter is seen to predict exceptional longevity in humans and reaching your 90s, especially in those with a history of cancer. Centenarians, those who live over 100, haven't seen to have a mean IGF-1 of only 64 nanograms per milliliter, which is very low. However, their IGF-1 might be low because they're 100 years old, as IGF-1 declines with age so it might be a survivorship bias. All right, let's make a quick overview. Lower IGF-1 during development tends to result in longer life expectancy in animals. Very tall humans live shorter than less tall humans. Being extremely tall and extremely short, both aren't optimal, but moderate height and moderate weight appear to be associated with the longest life expectancy. Low IGF-1 appears to predict greater survival in humans over the age of 90. Low IGF-1 might increase the risk of neurodegeneration later in life, but it's not clear if these effects can be avoided by avoiding malnutrition. As I said earlier, the practical takeaway is limited because you can't control your height and you can't control your genes, but you can control your IGF-1 levels, which is a risk factor for heart disease, cancer, and all-cause mortality. IGF-1 levels are higher during youth and early adulthood at around 200 to 400 nanograms per milliliter and they decrease the older you get, which is technically a good thing for antagonistic pleiotropy. At age 40 to 60, average IGF-1 levels are around 150 to 250 nanograms per milliliter and they drop to 100 to 200 at the age of 70 to 80. As we saw from the 2023 meta-analysis, the lowest risk of cancer and overall mortality is seen at an IGF-1 of 100 to 120 nanograms per milliliter. However, the optimal IGF-1 for longevity might be even below 100, as long as you're not malnourished, you have adequate bone density and adequate muscle mass. I've had somewhat low IGF-1 levels for as long as I've measured it over the last 8 years, around 100 nanograms per milliliter. My last result in January was 94 nanograms per milliliter, and the lowest it's been has been 78 nanograms per milliliter. Based on observational studies, an IGF-1 below 100 would put me in the higher risk category, but based on the centenarian data, that IGF-1 would be beneficial for longevity. 
having low IGF-1 might reduce my risk of cancer based on the studies. And I do prioritize that because I have a family history of cancer, but it might increase the risk of dementia later in life, we don't know. In my opinion, the increased mortality seen from low IGF-1 comes from frailty and malnutrition, which I don't have a problem with. I have significantly higher muscle mass, muscle strength and bone density than the average people in my age group. I'm also not super tall or heavy. 177 centimeters and 78 to 82 kilograms, which isn't the lowest risk category for height, but it's in the middle. Why do I have lower IG-1? Maybe it's genetics, because like I said, it's always been around 100. But there are some lifestyle factors that do lower IG-1. I maintain a lower body fat percentage. I stay around 10% body fat year round. I don't overeat calories. I eat about 2000 to 2500 calories. I don't eat an enormous amount of protein, 1.6 grams per kilogram or 130 grams for me. However, my IG-1 has been around 100 even when I was eating 200 grams of protein in the past. Time-restricted eating and intermittent fasting lower IG-1 because you're spending more time in a fasted state that lowers IG-1. And lastly, I have optimal blood sugar levels and insulin sensitivity thanks to exercise. High blood sugar raises IG-1. So, in my opinion, an IG of 1 around 100 is optimal for longevity, as long as you avoid malnutrition, as long as you avoid low muscle mass and low bone density. It certainly appears to be optimal for minimizing the risk of cancer. If you want to know my full evidence-based longevity routine that covers diet, exercise, supplements, and more, then check out this video.